I, I refer to my investing as earn and learn. So I wanted to learn on different things. So I tried to invest in some different asset classes. Some of them fell in my lap. So one of them, you know, I cashed in some stocks that deal was supposed to close and literally fell through that day. And then I got sent an email from somebody I have a non-real estate investment with said, hey, we need to buy some land. They needed minimum was exactly what I cashed in to, to make the thing go. And so I said, OK, well, let me try this. This is and basically it was corporate secured debt to buy a piece of property up in uh, west of Dallas and, you know, 16 percent interest. They needed my money for a year. And I went, OK, well, this is a much better use of my money. Um, they needed it for a bit longer now. Um, and then, you know, I always wanted to get into retail. So one of my next investments I did was a retail strip center. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Trevor Thompson is a passive investor, now turned active investor. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hey, man, the pleasure is mine. There's three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell us where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah, so um, so I started passively investing and then I have 17 deals as a limited partner. My first deal as a GP where I joined the team for a new takeover of an asset in San Antonio. And my goal is to do two more active deals this year in Central Texas. Wow. Hey, that's awesome. I love that. I mean, in 17 deals, that is, um, that's a lot of progress. How let's, let's start with the idea because most people don't keep enough capital unused or untapped, right? Usually it's deployed in stocks, bonds, a variety of assets. I mean, maybe you did, maybe, maybe you had a liquidity event or something like that, but how did you, how, how have you gone out and, and taken the capital you had and made it available for syndications? Yeah, so I was very fortunate. I worked for a company called iFly Indoor Skydiving, and we got bought out by a private equity company. And so that gave me, in theory, the big payday, a financial event. And I put it all in different, different asset classes, mostly the stock market, and then always knew that I wanted to get involved in real estate. So I started out slow, joined a local mentoring program. What I liked about them is they were Texans doing deals in Texas, and that's where I was. So I felt like, okay, I can see these guys, touch them, feel them. And then I started passively investing. And I just slowly but surely kept creeping up how many investments I did based on opportunities. And then, you know, COVID happened. And uh, I woke up in the morning and uh, what, there was a day where my net worth and the stock market went down 30%. And I thought, man, there's got to be a better way to do this. And then as it started to recover, which of course is more than recovered, but I managed to get keep pulling money out. And then to be honest, I was trying to go active earlier. So I would get real close to a deal, know I'm going to need some earnest money, cash in some stuff only to not win best and final. And so now I got this money sitting in a bank account going backwards. Um, and then a nice deal would pop up in my inbox. I would look at it and say, okay, so I'm a little out of balance. And eventually once those passive, you know, come off, then I'll switch most of that cash over to active because you should always invest in your own deal as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. That's uh, that, that is unique. The, the, the indoor skydiving, that's, that's one of those big uh, places where they build like the, I don't know, 10 story buildings or whatever it is. And yeah. The wind. So I started in Orlando, Florida with the original owner. And the cool thing about that is more than 20 years ago um, on our very first team meeting, he gave everybody a copy of rich dad, poor dad. Um, so talk about like kind of telling the future. And right. he just said, you guys need to set up your lives so you have some sort of passive income. Do not be job dependent. And then I put that book on the shelf and spent about the next uh, 17 years being job dependent. I did not start investing. Wish I had my advice to anyone out there. Start early. Um, you know, buy real estate and wait. Don't wait to buy real estate. And uh, I definitely would be in a completely different position right now if I did that. Mm. Um, but again, you start where you start and then it's just, you go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So your hunt, you went, you know, you, you participated in all these passive deals and then eventually you became an active member of a general partnership. But yes. before that, from what I understand, you kind of backdoored your way into being an active member as a limited partner. 
Yeah. Um, so what happened was that was part of my mentorship program. And so it was actually my first investment. I put some money in a property and I'll be honest, I didn't know what I was investing in. Right. I had a little bit of education. I was just like, OK, I'm going to go along. These are the people I've sort of linked myself to. Um, I'm going to go along. And then, you know, it's about a year, 14 months into it. I said, I'm not learning anything. I thought I would learn a little more as a passive investor. And this particular deal, they, they, I have other deals that disclose much more information and you learn a lot more. This one, Ben, they only told you what they had to tell you. Right. So, but anyways, I went and saw the mentor and said, hey, I've got some extra time because of the way my work schedule was, I was doing weekends. So I've got some days off, there. anything I can do to help out and learn. And so they said, okay, well, we'll make you the asset manager for one of our properties. Um, very interestingly, the first time I showed up at the property, I went, oh boy, what did I invest in here? Um, you know, it was told that it was a C plus property and it was a D and, uh, it had a lot of issues and, but anyways, I saw that as a challenge and I was at the beginning assisting their asset manager. Mm. So being like a bit, uh, detailed orientated, I went in there and started looking at stuff and I started finding all these things that were wrong. And I'm like, well, this can't be right. So I made this big list, made an appointment with the main sponsor and said, listen, um, we're not at 92% occupancy. There's this many units that people have skipped. They just haven't moved them off of the rent roll. So in reality, you know, we're 86% occupied. And I know this is a problem because we want it to be stabilized and all these things. And so then eventually that asset manager said, well, they told us to do that. And then everybody, you know, blamed everybody else. Well, at the end of it all, that was the end of that asset manager. Oh, there was some other things too, invoices in a drawer. So you'd already done the work, but you didn't want to pay the bills because you had to stay in budget. Well, you already spent the money, <laughs> you know, it's eventually you got to pay the bills and we were on hold. And so I became the full-time asset manager for that property and we still struggled a little bit. So the GP decided, well, it had to be the property management company. Let's fire them and self-manage. Uh, but don't worry, we'll help you. Uh, well, the will help you was uh, few and far between because he had about nine different assets that he did that to at the same time. So now he had no asset manager, fired the property management company, and basically tried to appoint one of his investors at each of his locations. But I learned a ton. I mean, just a ton. We started really taking care of the property. We started making the conversion. So I started in January of 2020. And then we all know what happened a little later in 2020. Right. And, you know, when you're on a deep value add project that most of your people are living paycheck to paycheck, barely met the income requirements to get in there, um, it starts to hurt bad. And, uh, you know, they stopped paying, they started doing different things and took some of them would refuse to sign the rent relief program paperwork and, uh, you know, it was very interesting. And, you know, and then all well, the relief checks, rent check, relief checks are coming. So this will be great. Somebody will come in and pay the rent. Um, that Monday morning, there was 27 big screen TV boxes at the dumpster. Um, so they bought a big screen TV instead of paying the rent with their rent, you know, with their relief checks. And uh, again, it is that type of workforce housing at the D class. Um, anyways, it was a real struggle. And then I did that for about 10 months. And then we just had some real, I spent all those 10 months cleaning up the property. And then they basically wanted to give it all back up to quickly fill the occupancy so they could sell it to the next person, um, you know, looking better. And I just refused to do that. Um, did not want to do that. So it sold about a year and a bit later. I fell through on that sale. And unfortunately we made no money, but we didn't lose money. And I think if I hadn't have been there for that particular period, we could have definitely lost some money because at least we got it up stabilized. Yeah, man. But that, I learned a ton. You can't ask for a better learning. <laughs> that's uh, that's one way to look at it. I mean, my gosh, for your first passive investment, that's um, that was your first, right? Did I hear that yeah, right? Yeah, it was my very first passive investment. And and I drove to, I, I actually kept track of it because I thought at some point I at least might get paid my mileage. 12,780 miles driving from Austin to San Antonio for 10 months. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I just got my money back and a, and a, and a small thank you, but not much because 
after I left, when they did their investigative calls, they, they blamed previous management. It wasn't named by name, but, uh, you know, it was just, they were looking for somebody to blame other than themselves, which uh, learned a lot about a sponsor. Right. Were there any things, let's talk about that for a minute. Were there anything that now, because now you've been in 17 deals, are there, were there telltale signs that uh, would have tipped you off or would tip you off now? Yeah, definitely. So when I looked at, when I went back and kind of, and I actually asked, could we have a learning session to what happened? Um, they did not want to do it. I said, with the investors, you know, we're, we're all part of a mentor program. Let's at least learn. Like it's one thing, okay, we're all big boys and girls. We didn't make money. We all know there's risks in real estate. Let's at least make this a better learning opportunity, but the, they weren't up to that. But basically when I look back at it, they underestimated um, their CapEx by a substantial amount of money. I mean, right. substantial, you know, they ran out. I think they misappropriated some of it, not like maliciously. So they wanted to rebrand the property. Okay, this was known as a drug infested gang den. I mean, this is what this place was, you know, this was. And so they decided, oh, if we use the back entrance and spend a bunch of money and fix the back entrance up and rename that as the new street address, um, people won't figure it out. Um, but people figured it out. And to be honest, GPS still sent me to the front door. Um, and it just, you know, so spending $100,000 fixing up the back entrance versus taking care of plumbing and some of the other issues, it would have been a much better use of resources. Um, they underestimated the increase of property taxes and insurance. So kind of three big things in Texas. And, um, you know, so it all, those things all added up. And uh, then they were trying to get out of um, bridge debt. And of course, when you're not stabilized, going from bridge to bridge is very challenging. Right, right. That's how would you, again, going back, I mean, the, the thanks for share, sharing the light on those topics, but were there things now that you would see before you ever invested your money as a passive investor where you'd say, yeah, that's that. This doesn't smell right. Yeah, I think just the underestimation of those things. Like now, when I look at investment, I look at the capex. Is it realistic? Can they achieve it with their plan? Do they have enough money? I look at what have they done with property taxes? You know, so they're going to buy this property and increase the value, but they don't increase the property taxes. And right. Texas, those property taxes are huge. Right. And then, of course, insurance. Texas insurance has been going crazy. Now, they could say, okay, we couldn't foresee that. That was a few years ago and maybe. Um, but they, you know, and then they just underestimated everything, you know, like how much, of, you know, $5,000 to turn a unit. It was $7,500 to turn right. a unit. Well, you get out of whack pretty quickly, um, you know, when you get that kind of disproportionate per unit to turn yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting point. And for those of you who are listening, uh, yeah, taxes are a big deal. And we've certainly walked away from deals just because we've known that if we buy it, that then it's going to get reassessed. Uh, and depending on the on the on the on the geography, get, get reassessed based upon what we just bought it for. Not every not every town is that way, but some places are. Uh, and then the other thing is the hardening of the insurance market. Yeah, maybe you couldn't have seen that. You know, we've I've had a lot of guests. Uh, in the insurance industry come on the show and they would say, hey, you know, rates may have been the same 16, 17, 18, but we're seeing 10 to 20% increases annually right mm -hmm. now on, especially on multifamily um, insurance. So, you know, if you like your, to your point, if you're not seeing those things underwritten, then, I mean, that money's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. And that's, uh, and then, and then also the third cardinal mistake that I think you bring up, this, and this, these are, these are gold, golden mistakes um is is underestimating capex not raising yeah. enough for that i mean again uh, this is unfortunately not an uncommon uh not an uncommon uh thing i've heard on this show which is hey if we've made a mistake that they, they've fallen into those three categories quite a yeah. few times so that's uh that's really really interesting tell me you have you've really done a great job personally you know across 17 different assets of diversifying tell me yeah. how you have selected your different asset classes you know, so part of it was I, I refer to my investing as earn and learn. So I wanted to learn on different things. So I tried to invest in some different asset classes. Some of them fell in my lap. So one of them, you know, I cashed in some stocks that deal was supposed to close and literally fell through that day. And then I got sent an email from somebody I have a non real estate investment with said, hey, we need to buy some land. They needed minimum was exactly what I cashed in to, to make the thing go. 
And so I said, okay, well, let me try this. This is, and basically it was corporate secured debt to buy a piece of property up in uh, west of Dallas and, you know, 16% interest. They needed my money for a year. And I went, okay, well, this is a much better use of my money. Um, They needed it for a bit longer now. Um, And then, you know, I always wanted to get into retail. So one of my next investments I did was a retail strip center. And it's very similar to multifamily. So you basically, you buy an old dilapidated retail strip center. You basically try to convert the tenant base, put them on what's called a triple net lease, um, where the tenants are responsible for all the payments. There was a restaurant that hadn't paid its rent in a while, and we knew they were going out. So find a new restaurant tenant, basically rebrand the plaza, and then sell to somebody who doesn't need the large return. They're looking for the security of a triple net lease. Well, great timing. We closed March 15th, 2020. Um, And thank goodness, um, obviously Q2 and 3 in 2020, we didn't get any, but Q4, we got a 5% cash on cash and all 21, we got a 5% cash on cash. So all things considered in the retail space, I feel very fortunate. Um, I'd like to do better. And, you know, I think retail is starting to recover. They did manage to take all of the leases and convert them to triple net. Um, so they basically used the COVID event and said, okay, we'll forgive the three months that you were forced to shut down. Uh, Cause that was about only shut down in Texas if you re-sign a new lease. So they got the extended leases, they got the triple net. So that was good. Um, another very interesting one was to buy it again, lots of things happened with COVID, buy an underperforming apartment complex, convert it to condos. And that's in Austin, there's a big housing shortage. A lot of people want to try to buy, but they can't necessarily afford it. So they bought this uh, 32 plex of apartment complexes, four and eight, four plex and eight plexes, and started converting them over to condominiums and selling them. And it was a pretty slow start because it was really hard to sell the first four plex because the rest of the place looked pretty ghetto still. But eventually they started cleaning it up and they spent some extra money fixing the exterior of the other ones, even though they hadn't turned the tenants. And again, you have an underperforming asset and a a no eviction moratorium comes in. And so you can't get those tenants out. And then Austin was one of the slowest ones to actually go back and allow you to do evictions. And then, of course, once we did, they were backed up on permits at the city. And then, of course, the supply chain issue. But... At the end of the day, the beautiful thing is that there's such a housing crisis in Austin that housing prices have gone insane. And so what was selling for $265,000, they just sold one for $450,000. Um, insane, right? So we're all going to be made whole. It's going to be, a, it's going to be fine. Um, but it could have ended quite badly. Um, because again, who expected anything like that to ever happen? Um, and then I did a medical center and it's a little different. It, it's not like a high return. This was just a 10% prep return, no upside. But again, you're very interestingly, you're buying a building. It was missing one tenant. They did some, you know, deferred maintenance, put everybody on a triple net lease. And the crazy thing there is the practice of the doctor and the doctor personally guarantee all the loans. So you want to talk about a safe, uh, safe investment, you know, and again, that was a great place for some retirement money, just at the 10% return. I was okay with that. Um, and then very interestingly, the group that I joined mostly does single family. Hmm. Um, so they did a syndication for a single family fund. And so they raised about two and a half million dollars. And anybody in the single family business knows your biggest cost is those hard money loans to right. run out and get a job, get a property. Well, now they got two and a half million bucks sitting in a bank so they can move quick on a distress. So, Hey, I can give you cash today, you know, and their plan was, you know, $200,000 ARV, two bedroom, three bath or sorry, three bedroom, two bath, no swimming pools, $200,000. And been a bit of a challenge because obviously housing has gone crazy in Texas as well, but on the good side, you know, those assets they bought, that had an ARV of 200,000 and now are sitting in the fund at, you know, almost $300,000. I mean, they've gone up a third in value. Um, And that also in turn allows them after the first year to really do something with the rents. And the idea of this fund is quite interesting. They're going to build it up to a critical mass, get a portfolio loan, pay you back your money, build the portfolio a little bigger and then sell it to somebody bigger 
and in theory, double your money on the, on the second, on the other side. Um, so I think that one's coming along really well. That's fantastic. I love, I love the, uh, the variety that you have invested in. Have you ever figured out the blended, um, kind of return profile across all, you know, so it's been challenging to do that because most of the apartment investments are value add. So, you know, even though they have a seven prep, you know, everybody was very honest. Hey, we're not going to catch up till 18 months. And so most of them are just starting to get close to catch up. Um, but it, you know, blended, I'm probably still around 14%. Um, and that's because I had two that paid nothing, right. um, you know, but uh, I can still live with 14% blended. Right. And and that's, and I think that's the beauty of it. And the beauty of what we do is that you can achieve, you know, above market returns in a, in a fairly predictable, obviously you've got some more stories here that tell us not everything's predictable, but a fairly predictable manner. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, to, to, to tell the average market investor, Hey, you can make 14% on your money and, and retain your, uh, you know, the, the balance of your equity position in the deal is um, pretty incredible. So, yeah. And of course, the big tax difference, right? So um, my very first deal I did that had a cost seg was at the very end of, nine, at the very end of 20, um, you know, put $50,000 in the deal, got a $46,000 passive loss and happened to be smart enough that, hey, I ran that apartment complex for 10 months. I'm now a professional real estate person, yeah. even though I collected severance the whole year. I wasn't working. It was purely severance. I could show the hours. And so even though I didn't get paid, I did get paid because you know, reduced. I didn't go to zero like everybody claims, but you know, I went from you know mid thirties to eleven percent effective tax rate. Uh, that that made life a little easier. <laughs> a little bit easier. That's fantastic, Trevor. Thank you for taking the time to come on today. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, so I'm very active on LinkedIn and Facebook, so you can find me, K. Trevor Thompson. Um, I have a website, Niagara dash investments.com and then I email ktt at niagarainvestments.com so those are the three ways that you can reach me wonderful trevor thank you for your time today i certainly oh, it's my pleasure it's great to be here